welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sift through philosophy, find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and my co-host is Dr. Greg Sadler. Today, we are going to be talking about the meanings of truth. And this is a bit of a holdover from our, our last show, where we were going to talk about memory and truth. And we did talk a lot about memory. And we did mention truth uh, a few times, but we didn't get into some of the the meat that we wanted to delve into last time. So we, we decided we needed to do a whole show about that. And who knows, we might keep on going after that <laughs> if we don't get through everything that we've, we've settled on. Uh, and the memory show was a lot of fun. Um, mm-hmm. that, that was a, a great conversation. Um, I think when we get into these epistemological issues, they, they often seem very abstract as you're approaching them. But then when you think about how many ways they figure in our, our life and our shared experiences and the things we argue about and the things we worry about, they're, they're actually really important for, um, you know, like you said, you know, we, we try to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Um, not everything that we're going to say is necessarily going to be words of advice, but it's things that you could you could apply, things that you could get some mileage out of, right? Right. The whole process of trying to understand us and to try to create a better map of reality for ourselves based on you know, uh, both philosophy and what we've been able to go through, you know, scientific inquiry, uh, and and then try to, you know, create a, a metaphysics that allows us to actually work through the, lo- the world that we happen to inhabit. Yeah, and the consequences for believing things that aren't true, it really varies. I mean, some things, you know, we were talking just before the show about some sci-fi stuff, and, and really what we do when we're reading sci-fi is we're allowing ourselves to be, in a certain way, lied to about <laughs> what, what exists and what's going on, but but it's entertainment. It's called buy-in in the industry. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, that that is often not pernicious, but, you know, we live in a time where people are thinking that it's a terrible idea to get, you know, vaccinated against a pandemic disease, right? And that's got some significant uh, impacts for, for a lot of people. Or there's, there's all sorts of beliefs about, like, who's trying to screw over who and take things away from them, and then people get targeted. Um, people make all sorts of bad decisions about their finances or relationships or, you know, really anything that can involve planning. If you're deprived of the truth, you're kind of in a bad way, right? And, and if you're the one who's depriving yourself of the truth because, you know, it's uncomfortable or you've bought into things that you shouldn't have uh, or would be you know, bad for you to have done, uh, that's, that's really quite a tragedy, isn't it? Right. The, the difference between, I guess, being deceived externally versus being deceived internally, like once you've bought into a lie, even though there's, you know, a preponderance of evidence that actually shows that yeah. you're not holding a, uh, I guess, an idea that corresponds to reality yeah. as a primer and, you know, for I something that, to talk about re- sooner. Part of what we're going to talk about here is theories of truth. And mm-hmm. by these, we mean sort of grand perspectives on what it means for something to be true. And I think people are often mixed up, not just about like individual things, like is the door open or not, you know, or if I eat this uh, rotten cheese, will I get sick or not? You know, is it okay if I, if I just cut the bad parts off and then, then eat around <laughs> or something like that? Those are particular matters, right? But then there's like broader things where you see people and the way that they're going about things you can say, wow, that person is mixed up when it comes to how we engage in inquiry, how we sort out claims about, you know, what's real, what's not real. Um, They're mixed up sometimes about how how we would look at authorities, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think studying these theories of truth can actually be helpful for for quite a few people in thinking about, well, what, what does it mean for things to actually be True. How do we arrive at, at truth? Mm-hmm. And this is the core of epistemology. And we have a, yeah. n- a number of different 
uh, avenues to walk down here, um, as we will get into. But I know that you had some uh, yeah, I th- common sayings uh, that uh, from history that you want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, I thought, I thought it would be good for us to like kick these around a little bit. I, I think everybody's heard most of these. Um, you know, for example, Pontius Pilate in the narrative when, you know, Christ is brought before him, he says this, this phrase, what is truth, right? And some people kind of portray him as if he's like sneering, like, what is truth? You know, it doesn't matter at all. But other people read it and they're like, hey, maybe this guy is actually asking, well, what's, what's truth? You know, maybe you know, uh, tell me, tell me what's going on. And then Jesus doesn't say anything. And, you know, the whole thing goes on but that's a really central question um and and mm-hmm. you've got a a leader you know somebody who's i think governor right uh punches pilot of of that region and and so you know somebody when when somebody like that says what is truth and they're not just being cynical it, it's probably something to be concerned about right well i guess if if someone has no way of discerning truth then that might be something to be worried about, especially in that position. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm very happy when I hear uh, leaders say, uh, I don't know, but at least I'll look to find out. Because if you're just saying like <laughs> things to sound like you actually know, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is kind of like perception is better than reality. I guess, you know, many politicians don't ever want to seem to be like they might not know something because they'll, that would be used as a cudgel against them. But I think the the process of inquiry is better than the process of knowing. Yeah, you know, you bring up leaders, and so we've got political leaders, and that that's a big issue with them. But we could also talk about, like, in, in business, you know, the, the people who are the spokespeople, presumably they should know what they're talking about. Or if a CEO is questioned about their product, um, we want them – I mean, they might lie, but they, they might also um, – just not say anything. Who knows? And then, you know, we could talk about academic institutions. That's one where very often the people who are running academic institutions, at least here in our our country, and I'm thinking about like colleges, universities, they're not academics. They're more like business leaders. You know, they're the mm-hmm. people who can raise money and, and, and budget and make decisions like that. And quite often what they're, they're putting out there is truth. Um, almost immediately gets, you know, examined and then taken down by by people who are uh, closer to the ground, so to speak. And and we could talk about all sorts of other venues. Maybe there's something about truth and leadership that we we should explore as a separate topic uh, down the line. What is what does leadership really mm-hmm. require of of good leaders? Right. You know. Mm-hmm. And uh, any of these other ones that you really wanted to dig into. Well, so what do you make of this one? This is Aristotle talking about um, his teacher Plato. It says, though we love both the truth and our friends, piety requires us to honor the truth first. So this is, you know, something Aristotle says where he diverges from, from Plato. Um, and, you know, the idea is, well, listen, my, my teacher, who I studied with all this time and I love the guy, he says this, but the truth isn't there. We, we should, you know... Go the other way. Um, I mean, and we can apply this to not just like a teacher-student relationship. What about in your family? You know, what what if you find out that the origin story that your family has been telling all this time? You know, you do some genetic testing, and you know, you start mm. looking at newspaper clippings. Isn't really that true? Should you upset the proverbial apple cart and you know tell everybody, no, no, no. Here's here's what actually happened. Um, you know, great example of this is the families that claim to have Native American heritage, and it's almost always a Cherokee, you know, in, in the background. Um, what if you do genetic testing and you find out there isn't any of that going on? Um, should you, like, confront them about that and say, listen, you're, you're doing this thing that's kind of popular and playing off of other people's um, ethnicities using this trope, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, maybe maybe it, it, it is very important that regardless of what our affective, 
you know, friend-like, familial connection is with people that we have to honor the truth more. I, I, I know I've been that kind of person, and that sometimes creates mm-hmm. friction. I kind of right. suspect that you're that kind of person, too. <laughs> <laughs> right? So there, there's like, yes, I definitely... I'm just thinking about, like, my own life and my own, like, family and, like, you know, I'm thinking about first the things that uh, we don't talk about or we do talk about in, in play okay. company type things. And so the, the, there's definitely <laughs> political divides and there are certain things that I won't quite bring up because I don't believe that they um, really uh, have a, a grasp on reality on certain things um, based on their kind of, like, their political tribe. But I don't always bring it up like i brought it up like once or twice but i let it drop for the while because it's it doesn't yeah. actually benefit me or the family or the uh coherence therein of of or sorry, the cohesiveness of the family um in that regard and so i'm like i'm thinking about like what what is the good that are arrives from this or derives from this and uh, as long as it's not leading them to make a particularly like harmful decisions for other people, then I usually let it lie. But if I do believe it's going to cause harmful things, then yeah, I definitely am out there being a a paladin for truth. I mean, there is something to be said for when to say things or what way to say things and how how much to push. You know, if you're um, constantly the truth teller, um, Mm-hmm. That, almost, that almost might have like a similar thing to like the boy who cried wolf, right? The boy who cried wolf lies all the time. And mm-hmm. if you're telling uncomfortable truths to people all the time, maybe after a certain point, they just tune you out, you know, um, it's equally ineffective. So I suppose we could talk about the, how we make truth effective. Um, right. You think uh, Al Gore is that? I, you know, I, has he been on the radar l- lately? Um, I, all, all I know is the Al Gore of like you know the 2000 election, and then um, I was thinking of the inconvenient truth specifically. That oh. was kind of his war drum for the longest time. And, yeah, and yeah. Any time I see him, he still talks about it. Okay. Um, but like he doesn't get as much purchase anymore. I don't know exactly. There's probably a number of reasons, but like if that's if you're always just railing against like, hey. Where we're you know slowly sliding towards an apocalypse, you know, people don't tend to want to hear that. Yeah, there there's a certain um, in our time at least there's a certain anesthetization that takes place when you keep hearing bad news over and over again. I mean, again, think about COVID, right? So mm-hmm. when when the COVID um, pandemic first began and we had the lockdown here in Milwaukee and we're all like, oh, we got to be really careful. Let's wipe everything down. And, you know, now everyone's going to wash their hands. I mean, some people still weren't washing their hands, obviously, um, you know, but we're, we'll wear masks and be really careful about who we spend time with. Although, mm-hmm. of, of course, there were some people who were partying and <laughs> doing things like that. Um, after a while, you, you get to the point where you just get kind of worn down with hearing more and more stuff about it. Think about how, how the, the, the death toll. I mean, it, it, it's, yeah. you know, for a while. It got up to 3,000 uh, people a day. That's yeah. Like one and a half September, or that's a September 11th a day. Yeah. And, and, and I think people became kind of numb to that after a while. Um, And those are truths, you know. Um, I mean, there's a lot of debate, you know. Well, you know, were these really COVID deaths or were they COVID related or were they things that were getting counted as COVID even though they they weren't? And we can say, well, there's there's some uh, questions at least. I I don't myself have that much suspicion when it comes to those sorts of things. But I know there's a lot of suspicion out there that, that, you know, these were not accurate. But then we, we have to ask ourselves, well, how the hell would they know the people who are saying that they're inaccurate? What do they have that shows us, you know, a better picture of, of things, uh, a more accurate picture of things? Um, well, let's talk about a, a, maybe a few others of these. Um, so Henry David Thoreau says, rather than love, than money, than fame, give me truth. And you could say, okay, that, that makes sense. You really like the truth. Um, is it really that valuable, though, to have, have the truth? I mean, if you do have love, if you do have money, if you do have fame, 
Couldn't you get by with maybe less truth? What do you think? Maybe being lied to every so often, but you know, mm. people give you affection and money and uh, I guess um, love, money, and fame, at least from a, a stoic perspective, are externals. Whereas truth is something that can actually oh. lead you towards making a virtuous action, which is actually a yeah. good. So I guess I would tend to agree with Thoreau here. From a stoic perspective, one of the virtues is directly concerned with truth, and that's wisdom. You know, So you, you mm. couldn't possibly be wise being disconnected from truth and, and saying, ah, yeah, this other stuff, that's better for me. I'll take that. <laughs> instead <laughs> uh, I, I would like to go back to the aristotle one just for okay, a yeah, moment yeah. concerning so like it depends on the the group that i'm in and there are certain groups where you know, there are certain relationships that need to be maintained with like you know uh, a light touch okay um, that's a good way to put it yeah and to know when to choose your battles um but then i also i have a group that um I, I talk with at least weekly, if not more, um, who like one of our, our like primary basis is for our discussion is no dogmas. Like you you can discuss and, and argue for anything and just because you argue for something or or not argue for something, that is not a, a pr there's yeah. no prerequisite for you being here or not. And so that that's I really love being in that place because I can just like um, you know, go right into the the debate, and there's there's no pretext to be like maybe hurting someone's feelings. It's all just like it's just we're just talking about ideas, and if we can divorce those so ideas, so you feel a greater sense of freedom, right? Right, is part of it, and you're you're more able to be be yourself or to try out ideas or um, what else would be goods that are associated with that to. You'd have like genuine, good good faith conflict, right? And and those are things that you can't have in the other setting, right? Right, because yeah. most other most other, almost every other setting, like if you present a view that might be a little bit outside the norm, you could just get absolutely ostracized. Yeah, I I have a friend who's uh, quite wealthy. And um, he's very honest, too, about how he came by his wealth. He's like, yeah, I just happened to have made a couple decisions that I, you know, I, I, I didn't have, like, inside knowledge or anything. They just happened to be right place, right time, and <laughs> things worked out. And he says that there is a, um, a real difficulty in getting people to be honest and straight with you <laughs> once you're rich. Yeah. You know? And, you know, I have to take it. Yeah, I'm not rich, so I have to kind of take take him at his word on that but it makes sense you know um and he brought up um you know employees and and other people he brought up um relatives and then he brought up um in, in case of dating mm -hmm. you can never quite be sure that somebody really likes you for you you know rather than for all the things the money not just your money but all the things the money can can uh, offer um yeah, that's why you see a lot of uh, especially professional athletes will keep their friends from before they were rich and famous um, as a... Because they can rely on them as actual friends, right. right? That's an interesting idea. So I wanted to bring up um, this other one, and this is more of a pop culture one. You know, I, I think everybody's familiar with it. You want the truth, you can't handle the truth, right? That came from a movie that had Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise, and uh, Jack Nicholson was the one who said it on the stand as Colonel Jessup after they'd, you know, they'd killed a guy, mm -hmm. and, and he's saying um, uh, the truth is something essentially that only certain people can, can have. Only certain people <clears throat> are entitled to it because they, they can understand the context. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I want to say that, okay, there's something to that, right? Not everybody necessarily is entitled to every truth. And some people can't handle some truths that you, you might tell them. But I also want to push back against that and say, well, maybe even if people can't handle it, maybe they are entitled to 
the truth if they ask for it. Mm-hmm. What, what do you What do you think? I, I'm not I'm not completely settled on this myself. Immediate thought says that yeah, like there should not be any truths that are. Well, shoot, okay, so I'm, I'm thinking about things. So, like, I'm thinking about uh, edge case, nuclear proliferation. Okay. You know, um, if everyone had the exact way to produce a nuclear oh. bomb... <laughs> We'd be in real trouble, we, yeah. Yeah, and especially if it was easy to do. Um, yeah. Uh, and so there are certain truths that need to be guarded in that regard. But I mm-hmm. guess if we're only talking about truths of, like, what you you can, like deal with and, and try to make some understanding about, especially like this, him choosing or saying, you can't handle the truth and uh, because why they they killed this person. I kind of extrapolate this to, you know, being a general and deciding to send troops in knowing that you're like you know, half of them might die because that's what your casualty average is, but you're like yeah. trying to go for a, a larger thing and, and a lot of people wouldn't be able to make that decision and wouldn't be able to accept the truth that this is you know, I guess how you deal with that sort of situation. Um, but I don't think hiding that type of truth is particularly beneficial, especially if you give them the tools to actually help them understand how to understand it in in the proper context. The problem is that yeah. a lot of times these unfortunate truths are presented in a way to use as a cudgel against other people, especially for power, um, in because they intentionally yeah, yeah. Uh, remove or obfuscate the uh, context in which these decisions were made. That's a really interesting point about the difference between speaking a truth basically to like knock somebody else down or to refute them or to you know be the person who gets to take over and speaking the truth because it's the truth and people, you know, ought to uh, have, you know, correct opinions about things and, and are entitled to that. I think those are two very different things. And, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about for quite a while is it's, it's possible to tell a, a essentially false story that is true. It's true in its parts, but then it's the way you put them together and the way you structure it that you, you, uh, tell a false narrative. And then when, when the person is called on it, they can fall back on the bits and pieces and they're like, oh, but this is true over here. Mm-hmm. And it's very rare that they get, they get called on the totality of falsehood that they're engaging in. And so you can have things that are locally true being put together into uh, a, a narrative or an account that's actually false, you know? Right. What's, it, uh, what's the quote? Um... There are what, something about statistics and lies. Oh, oh, yeah. There's, there's lies, damned lies, and statistics. statistics right? Yeah. <laughs> I forgot who said that, but <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I actually heard another thing back when I used to be a mathematics major, and it was it was told to me by somebody who was outside of the field, but they'd they'd heard this thing, never trust a a statistic you haven't forged yourself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And that's why it's Um, so important if you're actually going to like grab something from science to actually potentially look at the paper, see how they actually came about these, this data and uh, yeah, the study. Yeah. yeah. Look at the, the parameters of the experiment because you know, you can massage those in so many different ways to get a wanted outcome if you are. Well, and that's become a bigger problem in recent years than it was in the past. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, as as the sophistication of statistical modeling, aided by you know computers, has increased, there's more opportunities to, like you said, to massage. And, and, you know, kind of select the data stuff that, that's going to fit your narrative. And there's also pressure to do so because if you can't show statistically, uh, what are they called? Significant. Statistically significant results, then nobody wants to publish your, your research. And that means that you don't get your paper for the year. You don't get, you know, grants. So there's, there's a lot of uh, 
motives for mm -hmm. for doing that. Plus, fame could be part of that, right? You want to have something to say that's interesting about what you did with these mice over here, mm -hmm. you know, and this drug. So, so you know, it's easy to find a way to um, tell a story with that data that isn't entirely true. Yeah, and and to add on to that, the rewards go for people making new discoveries and not for any of the scientists who are doing oh, replication right. and now i guess that was the whole what replication crisis that kind of came to a head i don't know eight ten years ago i want to say at this point in time yeah and the so in the social sciences yeah right? and, it, and it's, it's still a crisis because a lot of those studies haven't successfully been replicated so yeah. it hasn't gone away i, I uh, guess it's it's gotten better it's it's as from what i've heard um but yeah it's definitely not a, a solved issue <laughs> yeah. So I know that you wanted to talk a bit about the is ought divide and and what we could draw from from that in terms of truth. Right. So like this, this famously comes from David Hume. Um, you know, I believe that the quote is like one cannot derive an ought from an is, and an ought is like a a, a moral. You should be doing this thing. I ought to. Um you know, uh, drive safely. And I was like, and, yeah. and so the, the usual usage of this is like, well, how, how can you go from like a purely empirical place and, and try to make some moral judgments about things, but it's, it's not this divide. It's like, we're, we're always in concert with the natural world. It is us that we have the values and both, um, implicitly stated and also um, or sorry I explicitly stated and implicit in uh, our uh, upbringing that have these values baked into them and yeah. based on that intermingling do we actually come to certain moral truths and moral oughts and we can based on the kind of like the fact that we are rational agents or we all are you know human um, more or less that uh, because of by dint of our humanity that we have certain things that we all kind of move towards and we can create general odds from that. You know, it's, it's interesting. One of the things that comes up whenever I teach an ethics class, they're all, there's almost always a student at some point in the semester who, when we're, we're looking at some sort of moral theory perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And a moral theory perspective would be asserting some things to be moral truths, you know? Mm -hmm. You should do things this way, and here's how you should evaluate stuff. And they'll say, yeah, but everybody doesn't believe that, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you can say, yeah, well, sure. That's, that's one of the differences between um, moral truths and what we could call truths about the physical world or, or logical truths or things like that, that there is going to be some disagreement. It might take some moral development or developing a certain way of looking at things in order to, to get it some of the time. But it's interesting because um, when I've taught logic classes, there are, there are some students who just don't get that either. <clears throat> and, you, you know, you look at that and you're like, well, logic is supposed to be the laws of thought. You know, it's like supposed to be this baseline that everybody is supposed to almost like intuitively grasp. And then you build out from that into, you know, all sorts of cool theorems and proofs and stuff like that. And there are some people who just cannot grasp the truth table for implication. And you can explain it to them and you can like try all sorts of different tacks and they'll just... As some of them at a certain point will be like, oh, yeah, now I see. And then some of them just won't get it. And, um, you know, if, if logic is really what it's supposed to be, that should not be possible, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing, too, with physical, you know, truths about, like, the physical world. You know, we can, our perceptions can be off, you know. Um, and, and, you know, there's that old saying, well, who are you going to trust, me or your lion eyes? <laughs> <laughs> right? uh, there's all sorts of ways in which people get get things wrong about um what we what we take to be almost like bedrock the physical world you know mm -hmm. um 
And I suppose, too, there's probably some obstinacy and orneriness involved. There's some people who are just so contrary and that they won't accept that, like, your shirt is blue and my shirt is yellow. You know, you, you tell them that, they have, to, they have to say the opposite. And so well, I, you're, I, just your perception is it's yellow and blue. It's not a, the actual reality of the situation. Your, true, the quality yeah. that you have in your mind is different than mine. Yeah, actually, that reminds me. This is totally tangential. But do you remember that dress? Oh yes, that people the, were yes. Were getting... I'm yeah. The the blue and gold versus the whatever. Yeah. Yes. What was so striking about that is how angry people got that other people were perceiving it differently. Uh -huh. Same thing with those sound things where like you'd play a sound file and it could sound like it was saying one phrase or a different phrase. And I forget what exactly what they, they were kind of nonsensical things. Yeah. People would get really upset, you know? Yeah. But then again, people get really upset when it comes to matters of uh, taste, you know? Um, this pie is good. No, this pie sucks, you know? And people get really... <laughs> <laughs> you know, if it was just purely subjective and we, we actually did follow the, you know, uh, there is no dispute in matters of taste, people wouldn't get worked up about these things, but they, they really do. Once again, I will enjoy this tangent um, okay? because I, I once had a, a roommate who would not uh, follow me down to the conclusion that there's something as... Um, subjective versus objective and that <laughs> well i remember you took, yeah, tell this story this is really great um so yeah it was uh she was always angry after work um because like someone didn't see something the way she saw it um and and because everything she saw was objective truth um it, it really flustered her and and i somehow i caught wind of this during one of our conversations i'm like what do you mean you don't know what subjective is? And I'm like, okay, we can talk about, like, uh, in the intersection, and there's a, a car accident in the intersection, and you're on one street, and there's a big building blocking, like, 60% of your view of this intersection. And someone uh, on another street, and they, they only had 30% of their view uh, blocked from it. They see one thing, you see another thing. Your Your individual subjective realities lead you to perceiving uh the i guess the the primary fault of two different people um yeah but uh that one of these is definitely true or well, at least one of the, both of these can't be true at the same time they could, could both be wrong as well um because yeah, yeah. there's a, a gap in both of your perceptions but uh she just would not walk down that road with me that any <laughs> that that there could be anything that was not objective um well, it I, sounds too like she was also committed to the view that her view is always the best view right well her view was objective and thus okay. anyone else that deviated from that <laughs> was not objective and thus wrong wow that must have been a hard life yeah i i wish her well <laughs> just not in my house <laughs> I, I was actually thinking as you were talking about this about like when we're watching football right mm -hmm. and there's a play and you know we're, we're seeing everything from camera angles and um, we don't actually see what the refs who are like calling penalties are seeing because there's no camera I mean I, I hate to bring this up because maybe somebody will actually start suggesting putting cameras on, on the refs like we do now on, on cops or on other people, <laughs> right? And then that'll be broadcast. Um, you know, we, we don't see exactly what the ref sees. We see what the camera person who's operating like a drone or something like that has chosen to, to pick. And there'll be like these questionable calls, right? And then They'll, um, you know, do a replay of it and look at it from different angles. And the, the two guys in the booth will talk about it. And if it's sufficiently complex, they'll bring in Joe Pereira, you know, and ask him what he thinks. <laughs> you know, then five minutes have gone by of analyzing all this stuff. And, um, 
you know, do we ever get the, you know, the pure unvarnished truth of the situation? Not exactly. You know, Is, was, was this guy's foot in, you know, when he caught the pass or not? Or was this a bad hit? You know, all, all the different, th was this pass interference? All those sort of things that, that people get really uh, upset about. Um, you know, we can kind of know what's going on, but we can't, we can't know like from, some God's eye view that takes it everything perfectly. Yeah. Going back to our actual conversation, I'll, I'll <laughs> pose the question. Okay. Uh, uh, are there differences between moral and physical truths? And is that even a useful distinction? I mean, there are in that they're, di they're referring to different kinds of matters, right? And I think, I think the distinction is one that breaks down at some points, um, and they often do involve each other. You know, you think about any coordinated activity that has like internal norms to it that people have to like get into, like, you know, when you're working in a factory and people are like, get over there, do that, you know, oh, you did it wrong, man, you know. I mean, the first day in, or first week sometimes in working in a factory is usually not very pleasant because uh, you find out that there's this entire universe that you don't know about <laughs> that, that everybody else on the line does and they're all mad at you for getting it wrong. And they, they act as if, um, you know, they almost, this is kind of like an interesting kind of blur here because they talk in terms of is's in a very ought sense. And you're always, you know, you should have known this and you've got, got things wrong. And then, you know, you've kind of fit in. So I, I do think, going back to what you, to your question, yeah, I do think there's, there's differences between those and, and logical truths and other kinds of truths that we can talk about. But I think they blur into each other, and they often, it's hard to find them in pure isolation, you, you might say, you know, and from each other. It reminds me of, uh, physicists will usually uh, simplify things uh, just so you can get a, uh, uh, like, the, the, the basics of the idea, and they'll, they'll talk about the, um, there's a spherical cow. A spherical cow? Yeah. Well, you, you want to reduce it to a very simple geometric object. So it is a cow, okay. but it is also a sphere. And so it, it, it's it's nonsense, um, but it, it's, it's something that it's this, um, how can you um, talk about the physical world um, at, at such a like plain geometric physics-based yeah. area and not have like the rest of the accoutrements that come with a cow? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, a cow, you got the outside thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe that could be kind of spherical, although in Minecraft it's made of blocks and stuff like that too. But if you think about an animal in terms of its um, alimentary uh, canal, right? Starting from the mouth, going all the way to the to the rear, you know, where, where it's getting rid of stuff. Um, that's actually kind of long and complex, you know? Very. Um, I mean, what do we have, like 36 feet of intestines? I'm only six feet tall, so or I six, six feet three inches. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff coiled up around. You know? so, don't, don't get yeah. too vain on me, Greg. <laughs> Well, we should we should we should get to talking about these uh, the truths. theories of truth that we we're going to get into, <clears throat> and we're we're gonna we're gonna just jump into talking about some of these, um, and we'll see how much time we we have for them. Um, you know, when we when we teach this like in a philosophy class or if you look at textbooks or you go to Wikipedia as well, you'll see them referencing things like the correspondence theory of truth or coherence theory of truth or pragmatist theory of truth and then then some other topics as well. And you say, well, why why have a whole theory of what truth is? Um, shouldn't it be much more simple? Shouldn't there just be like one theory of, of what truth is? And, and you know, different um, theorists, not just philosophers, but also historians and theologians and novelists have, you know, kind of kicked these around. And some people favor one more than the other. And I think that when you look at it, you, you see that all of them are, you know, they're, they're getting some things right and they're missing some other things. So, you know, the correspondence theory, this is one that people 
very often go back to when they say things like, you know, something's true if it accords with the facts, you know, uh, if, it, if it represents things the way they are. And that works great for some some things. So, you know, like right now, <clears throat> um, we're communicating on, on Zoom and we're using these uh, backgrounds, these virtual backgrounds. So we both have books in the background and we can say that's false. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a... Uh, a fake backdrop essentially that's been created virtually those books that are in your background uh, maybe they're real mm -hmm. in some place maybe it's a photograph of something real um oh, but, but this is a not... real photograph well it's a real photograph right <laughs> that that's tr that that's correct that's true um but it's not one that depicts the reality of what's behind you mm -hmm. i know that in your place there's like, if I remember right, like a door or something like that. You've seen my studio that I'm talking from right now. So you know that there's like a chalkboard and some lights and things like that, not just books. So we can say that, you know, the correspondence theory of truth is good for this kind of thing. We can say, are things really the way that they're being presented to us? Um, or are they, are they not that way? Um, is, you know, is my cat downstairs or is she out on the street walking Milwaukee, you know, looking for mice or something like that? Uh, hopefully she's uh, downstairs because, you know, she's 18 years old, so I don't want her out hunting for, for mice. Um, and it could be wrong or it could be right, right? Right. So, you know, if I say to you something like, uh, you're going to die tomorrow um, because the, uh, the bus is going to hit you, uh, hopefully that's not true. Um, it, you know, it, it's true if that sort of state of affairs uh, corroborates it, you could say. So, I mean, this is kind of a naive and commonsensical way of looking at what it means for things to be true. And I think we get a lot of mileage out of this. I don't think we can ever get away from this entirely, you know, um, using other theories of truth. We have to have some things that are a matter of correspondence. Um but there's some problems with it as well, you know? So, for example, I guess a, a potential issue is this idea of, uh, like, it maps to reality. But whenever yeah. we create a, a map in our head of reality, um, the map isn't the reality. It is a map of the reality. And so there's always going to be um, some missing detail. And so the map is yeah. not the terrain is how this is usually put forward. And I think we actually spoken about this at least once before on the show. Um, yeah, you know the reality too might have changed in the process. Right. You know, you. <clears throat> I mean, here's one where it's not map is not exactly what we would use. We might use the image of like a picture. You know, we see somebody that we haven't talked to for a long time, that maybe we went to college with or high school with or worked with at one time, um, and we run into them and we're like, wow, you've really changed, mm -hmm. you know? Um, well, the map that we had in our head no longer corresponds to the, to the reality of the person. Um, and we can think of all sorts of things like that. I mean, a lot of times people don't realize that they've changed themselves. This is how, um, you know, people who try to, to exercise too hard into their 40s and 50s, and then they, you know, they're really sore the next day, or they sprain themselves, or they, they do some damage to their body. They still have a map of who they were and their capacities that doesn't fit the reality when they go to play, you know, some pickup football game on the weekend. This uh, whole map of reality. If you would want to put it in the other way, there's an interesting story about um, paper towns, and so paper towns were. A, a device used to basically watermark by companies that made maps and they would add fake towns to their maps so if anyone else reproduced their maps one for one and they put that <laughs> town on they knew that that was fake except for some people uh sorry some towns actually rose up in the spot on the maps oh wow and because a map had a name there, they named themselves that town. And so the, the map <laughs> begat the town even when there that's was awesome. no town there. Yeah, that's excellent. 
Um, I mean, that almost sounds like a story out of uh, Jorge Luis Borges, you know. Um, he has he has stories in which things like that occur. Uh, I mean, that could be a Kafka story, too, though, as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there, there's other issues, too, when it comes to the correspondence theory. Um, not everything is susceptible to being mapped out. You know, like when we when we say that um, it's it's a good thing to spread freedom across the world, what does that actually correspond to? You know, does that mean voting rights? Does that mean uh, the capacity to engage in what we call economic freedom, you know, to buy and sell things. I mean, it gets, it, a lot of things that we do this with, um, the words or, or terms are ambiguous or um, polysemic. They can mean different things. And it, it's kind of tricky sometimes to say precisely what we're mapping things onto. So, you know, with, with, with things like that, I think the correspondence theory breaks down a good bit you know I mean another problem too is it's not like we ever really encounter facts that are not clothed in some sort of interpretation or connection with other things um, I mean there are some things that we can talk about like the you know the, the bare taste of the tea that I'm drinking right now but anything that really matters is going to be involving some some interpretation you know and so the correspondence theory of truth acts almost as if we have this unmediated access to to reality it makes me i mean it's oh, oh go ahead it makes me think a little bit of um our investigation into the quantum realm and or even just you know not oh. even that you can go down to electrons and we have yeah. probability clouds of where these things reside but not a you can't say like for there there is an electron here you can say yeah. like there's yeah. a uh a 93 percent probability that electron was in within this volume around the nucleus of an atom um yeah yeah and, and that might be that... off but like you know once once we get to certain areas we just don't have the ability and we might never have ability because the uh you know the world of kind of newtonian physics that we tend to live in uh yeah yeah um the macro world yeah i'm talking about that, um yeah. breaks down when we're getting into this really small that's a good point yeah i hadn't thought about that um I think there's, I mean, there's other issues as well that will come up, but let's jump to the course, to the coherence theory of, of truth. This is often, you know, like counterposed. So you don't want to have a correspondence theory, you have a, a coherence theory. And the coherence theory says no one single proposition is true in and of itself. It's when you put them together. And it could be propositions, it could be thoughts, it could be whatever you're using to, to model these things. Um, it's when you put them together in a system in which they, at a very basic level, don't contradict each other, but you know, ideally, there's more than that. They they're relevant to each other. They cohere with each other. They complement each other, right? And it's when you put all these things together that you get truth, and the truth is in the coherence of these different, you know, bits of meaning with each other. And and I think that there is something to this. I mean, think about how we use language. Um, or think about the discipline of mathematics, you know. Um, coherence does work for, for those sorts of things. And, and a lot of what we take for granted, you know, our picture of the world isn't really a correspondence of what's in our head to the world. It's, it's much more like, you know, do our thoughts actually map on to each other? Is our little map inside our head coherent, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that's, that's important. And you now some thinkers take this very far, like, um, Hegel, for example, will say things like, you know, the truth is in the whole or their totality, um, which means that most of us are out of touch with truth most of the time, unfortunately, <laughs> or the truth that we have is just like a little T truth, not, not a capital T truth, like good old Hegel has. Uh, and I don't think we have to go that far with it in order to get get something out of this. But then we have to ask ourselves, well, how do we figure out if things are true or false? Well, we take all these 
ideas or propositions or whatever you want to call them and we bring in some new thing and we say, well, does this actually fit these or, or not? And if it doesn't fit them, then we say, ah, oh, it's false, you know? Um, well, the, it's it does, either it's false or we need to change something else. If, if you've got right. something that is too smacking in the face as true, yeah, yeah. Then, then something else has to budge, right? In this model of reality. Ideally. I mean, there are people who can put up with an awful lot of contradictory ideas b- bouncing around in their head, mm. aren't there? You know, I mean, the cognitive dissonance is supposed to be like this painful, uncomfortable sensation. Some people like seem to thrive on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? so, so I don't know. Um, and, and I know you wanted to talk about um, one, one of the big problems with this is Right, that we yeah. have, um, just because a you can have a wholly consistent and coherent world and philosophy, uh, this does not automatically mean it's true. And so, for example, you can you can make a sci-fi <laughs> novel, um, as uh, and it, everything in there is is totally internally consistent and everything is good in that regard, but you know it, it is a thing of pure fantasy. Um, yeah. And so you, you have to have, if you're going to have something that is trying to bring you back to truth within the world that we live in and the people that we live with, um, there has to be at least some grounding here and there um, to reality. I'm kind of thinking of like a hot air balloon as this idea of this coherence theory. And if it is totally unmoored and okay. it gets flown and it goes wishing through the sky. And then I, I, to even take that yeah, yeah, to yeah. an extent, you know, take certain um, political philosophies that lead to uh, atrocities and, and killings of like millions of people. And, yeah. and they, you know, if you look at most of them, they have a very coherent worldview and everything that they, they choose to do is for some value that they consider to be good. But this um, the vast majority of other people, do not hold to this. And so if, if there has to be one truth, then one of these things has to give. And yeah. and how are you going to arbitrate between these different worldviews? Yeah, and I suppose if you say, well, you know, let them fight it out and, you know, the, the most true one will live or, you know, replace the other, you've, you've left the coherence theory of truth behind. You've got, now got a different kind of theory of truth. Might makes right. Where... Yeah, basically. Or, um, I mean, that can fit in to some degree with the no th- notion of truth as socially constructed, um, where um, power struggles are part of it. You know, the, the things that we consider to be true are, in some respect, they're true. It, it, may, it relativizes things. True Things are true within a particular society or culture that in which that truth is constructed and that construction often does involve some you know power differentials or exploitation or violence or something along those lines i mean uh, to be fair there are a lot of truths that actually are socially constructed i mean mm-hmm. you know the stuff that we do in economics <laughs> basically <laughs> i mean to say that something is a social construction a, a lot of people hear that and they're like oh man it means it's totally fake and mm-hmm. You know, we could change it overnight. Like when people talk about race being a social construction. Race here in America is a, a socially constructed idea. There is no such thing as white or black or Hispanic or Asian in terms of like absolute, you know, genetic truths or anything like, like that. Um, you know, we, we can isolate different people coming from different places. That's what like 23andMe does. But there it's not like those definitions that we use um, the ones that we use in the U.S. Census and the ones that have like historical weight to them, mm-hmm. it's like, well, you know, you've got this gene group from this person group over here in this part of Europe, and this thing from you know Iran, and this thing from over here, and um, most of us actually, when we take these tests, turn out to be quite a mix and a mess. <laughs> yeah, I, that's kind of why I like the the different, I guess, term of the um, intersubjective reality. Yeah. Instead of yeah. this the social 
construction because it, it kind of comes down to this idea that we have objective realities. This is a glass. Um, yeah. Uh, subjective realities like um, I think the water tastes pretty good. And, and intersubjective realities like money and corporations or race in this regard. But they um, all of these things, because we socially agree that they are something, they can yeah. move um, and uh, change uh, and affect us all the same way that uh, objective reality does. And so... Yeah, and, and they do so historically through complex dynamics you know i mean think about our our own city of milwaukee right it's considered one of the most segregated large cities in the united states and it's not like at, you know at one point in time people were like hey everybody uh, get in your own group and go over there you know instead it was all these complex processes that did have to do with um, people labeled as this race, this race, this race, and then legal ramifications, and then um, you know where the schools went, and where the where the work went, and how transportation worked, and and where you could buy a house. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those things are are realities, um, but they relied upon things that were, in fact, well, whether we call it socially constructed or intersubjective. Um, they weren't based in like the order and nature of things, you know? I mean, it's interesting because one of the things the Stoics actually use as an example of an indifferent, the color of somebody's skin, black or white. Huh. And they use that as a classic example back in the ancient time. Um, we should, uh, I mean, we're not going to get to everything, I think. Yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about, about pragmatism. Um, do, you, do you think it's really is, pragmatic to talk about that in such a short amount of time? It could be practical. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we're not going to go deep into it, but um, there is this notion that um, was, well, you know, was brought about by these American thinkers like uh, Charles Sanders Peirce and William James, by, who, by the way, had a beef with each other over the name pragmatism. Uh, John Dewey is another good example. Richard Rorty is a, con a more contemporary example. And the idea is that truth, it, it's similar to the coherence theory, but also it, it brings some things to the correspondence theory. Truth is what works for us, um, what satisfies certain needs or desires, uh, meets human interests, uh, ties in with what James calls our volitional or passional nature. And when people hear that, they often get a little nervous. They're like, so anything can be true so long as you like it? And that's not what the pragmatists are saying, because that's not really practical. Mm -hmm. I mean, people get themselves in all sorts of trouble doing things like that, you know, doing get-rich-quick schemes. They're, they're more saying, listen, it, you can use the, the coherence and the correspondence theory of truth, um, but you do have to recognize that there's a lot of things that are true or are false on the basis of whether they actually do work or not. So if I, if I have a proposition like um, so-and-so would be a good um, significant other for me, you know, somebody I could, I could be involved with, if you don't actually operate according to something and maybe go on a date with somebody and, and put those beliefs into action, you're never going to find out. And, and what counts as good for me, I'm willing to bet, is a bit different than what counts as good for you in that respect. Um, we, we probably don't have exactly the same criteria and we have to kind of figure this stuff out along the way. And so sometimes we have to say, did it work? Didn't it work? You know. Um, and so I think that that's, that's part of it. I think we have to wrap up. We do. Up. So uh, we'll leave you the words of Arthur Schopenhauer. All truth passes through three stages. First is ridicule. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, is it accepted as being self-evident? <laughs> <laughs>